Abba, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you that you let us into your presence so willingly. You accept us just like we are. You let us not just sit at your feet, but climb up into your lap. You whisper things into our ear, bringing revelation to us that we would never have otherwise. And we ask that that is exactly what you do for us tonight. We don't know, and we desire to know. So teach us, Holy Spirit. We open our minds to you, and we ask that you would just deposit the truth inside of us, bringing it um, just to the forefront of our hearts, giving it clarity so that we can grasp hold of it and latch on to it. And I pray that you would fill my mouth with your words, that everything that is said tonight would be what you want said, the way you want it said, with your heart, clearly conveyed. And I thank you, Father, that as you speak, seeds are being deposited into our hearts, and I pray that they would take deep root and bear much fruit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, if you want to go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, Verse 10, we are in the process of learning how to live armed and dangerous, learning how to live in victory. And by learning to live in victory, we're learning to turn the tables on the enemy. And instead of us just being the weak victims of uh, his deceits and his strategies and his attacks, we are now becoming the stronger authoritative force that is defeating him. We're no longer being defeated, but we are living from our position of victory. And so it, instead of just taking whatever he's dishing out to us, we are successfully retaliating against him. And we've broken all this down into steps so that we can, uh, step by step, bit by bit, precept by precept, learn how to live this out. And so step number one to living armed and dangerous is knowing that you have victory through Jesus and letting that truth become your default thought so that no matter what situation you find yourself in or you're thrust into, you know that you conquer. You know that you win. No matter how the twists and turns may come, no matter what surprises might be along the way, you know that when it's all over, you're victorious. It, it's understanding that you're living and fighting from the position of victory. You're not trying to get to victory. You're already there, and you're living from that position. And knowing and understanding that, the, the key component to knowing and understanding that is understanding that truth supersedes fact. What's your facts? Are you sick in your body? That's, that, may, that may be a fact, but what's the truth? By his stripes, we are healed. That is greater than the fact that you're experiencing at the moment. And then we discovered that there are more steps to victorious living, to being armed and dangerous in Ephesians chapter 6. So we started at verse 10, and we'll quickly go through these. Verse uh, 10 says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That's step number two. It's to understand that your ability to withstand and apply great force and pressure has got to come from God. You, you will never have the strength to apply force. You will never have the strength to withstand great pressure. You have to rely on God's. And then in verse 11, Paul tells us to put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. You have to understand that the enemy has a strategy. He has a plan for your life. And the plan is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He really doesn't care how he does it. He's just going to implement plans and strategies in order to accomplish that purpose. Step number three is then you need to know your enemy. If your enemy's plans is to steal, kill, and destroy, then you need to know who your enemy is. And verse 12 tells us we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the unseen world. Your fight is not against people. Your fight is never with people. Your fight's not with your spouse. It's not with your coworker. It's not with your in-laws. It's not with the people down the street or the stranger you met at the Walmart. It's not any of those things. Your fight is with the enemy who is unseen and he lives in the spirit realm. So every problem you have, guess who's behind it? 
the enemy is. Every problem, every difficulty, every negative thing in your life, the source of that is the enemy in the spirit realm. So all of our solutions and tactics have to be spiritual in nature. Uh, verse 13 goes on. Uh, Paul is reemphasizing four things that he said in verse 11. To put on every piece of God's armor, then after the battle you'll be standing firm. So the four things that he really wants us to understand about that is the armor is God's. It is divine in nature. There is nothing human about it. Number two is you have to put on every piece. You can't live in victory. You can't be armed and dangerous if you've left a part of your armor off. Number three is put on. Every time he tells you put on or pick up, which indicates it's a choice. I choose to live in victory. I choose to be armed and dangerous. And then the fourth thing is, only by putting on the armor are you able to stand. If you don't have on the armor, you won't remain standing after the battle. Then step four is found in verse 14 where Paul says, stand your ground. We talked about the fact that that means you are refusing to be moved. You are committed you are not going to let anything that you see or hear or feel or experience shift you from your position that Christ has given you, and that's the position of victory. Step five is found also in verse 14 where he says, putting on the belt of truth. That's our first piece of armor. And what that means is we're wrapping Jesus, who is the truth, around the center of our existence. And we're letting him, Jesus, the absolute truth, be the foundation of our life. Everything that we do, everything that we say, our motives, our actions, our feelings, everything has got to come from the place of truth. It's got to line up with truth. Then step number six is found, is found at the end of verse 14 where he says, and the body armor of God's righteousness. He's telling us to put on the belt of truth and the body armor of, of God's righteousness or the breastplate of righteousness. So that's a two-step process, if you'll remember. And the first step is, is experienced when we accept the gift of salvation. And then God's righteousness is then imputed to us or it is deposited into our spirit. And that establishes our position of righteousness. Step number two to wearing the breastplate is then to live from that position and practice righteousness Practice the right standing that we now have with God in Christ Jesus in our everyday life. That's what, uh, means, that is what it means to wear the breastplate of righteousness. And by doing that and living out God's principles in every area of our life, then we are now protected from the fatal blows of the enemy. Because righteousness protects those vulnerable areas of our life where one blow could easily destroy us, ruin us, make a mess of our life. Step seven, that's what we finished the last time we met two weeks ago, is found in verse 15 where Paul writes, For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. We are able to stand firm when we are wearing the shoes of peace that come from the good news. When we dig into the good news, which is the gospel, which is the word of God, the message, about, the message about Jesus, and we meditate on that, and it is the focus of our thoughts, it's what always is floating to the surface, it becomes our focal point, then we are able to experience undisturbed rest and tranquility first in our spirit and then in our soul. And it is in this undisturbed rest and tranquility in our spirit and soul that we're able to stand firm regardless of what's going on. Peace enables us to stay fixed in our position, unmoved by our circumstances, unmoved by our emotions that sometimes scream at us and tell us to take drastic measures to get ourselves out of the place where God wants to work in our life. That in places where we need to stand our ground, yet the enemy is pursuing us and yelling at us and screaming negativity at us, and we want to just tuck our tail and run because it's hard or it's difficult, and we feel stress and we feel anxiety and we feel unrest. But by wearing 
the shoes of peace that come from the good news, by keeping our thoughts fixed on the good news, and we talked a lot about what good news is, and, and the abundance of the good news that is in the word of God, when we are fixed upon that, it brings undisturbed rest and tranquility to my soul, and my emotions settle down. So that then I can make the right choices, which means I am now bending my will to God as opposed to bending my will to my hysterical emotions. Right? Okay. So, step number eight. That's where we're at. This is found in verse 16, if you want to go there. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. So our next piece of armor is the shield of faith. Now, remember, we are looking at the Roman soldier's armor because Paul is writing this letter from prison where he sees Roman soldiers every single day and he is drawing the correlation between their regalia, the things that they are wearing in battle, drawing the, the example between that and what it would look like for us spiritually. And so in order to get a good picture of what he's talking about in regards to the shield of faith, we got to understand what a Roman soldier's shield would look like. So when going into battle, a Roman soldier always carried a shield. And the Greek word that Paul uses in this passage is the word thureos. And that's important to know because there are lots of uh, various types of shield that a Roman soldier could carry. So by using the specific word here, he is letting us know that he is talking specifically about the type of shield that they carried into battle. And it was heavy, it was oblong, and it was a full body shield. Um, I, as I've said earlier, I read a lot of different accounts about what that could possibly be. And this is the three that I heard the most of, that it was the size of a full door or that it was somewhere approximately, approximately between two and three feet wide and four feet long. And I also read that it was often made to accommodate the size of the, the soldier who would be using it. So the taller or the broader you were, the longer and the wider your uh, shield would be. So while I doubt that it was the size of one of our doors today, because I just you know, I mean, I know I'm a girl and I'm not nearly as strong. I just cannot imagine carrying one of those sides of that door into battle. I mean, how in the world could you do anything? You know, how could you run? How could you whatever? It, it kind of seems to me that it probably was somewhere about three feet wide and about four feet long. But it was intended to cover the entire body. So what that means is, as opposed to the round swords that you often saw, uh, them carrying when they weren't in battle uh, that were about, you know, this, about this round right here. They were carrying a much bigger version that they could easily hold in front of them and then with just minimal bending of the knee be completely hidden behind this, okay? So that was the purpose, was to be able to put your entire being behind this sword, uh, behind the shield, rather. And so uh, the cool thing about the shield is that every soldier had one. It, it wasn't just that some did and some didn't. It's everybody had one. And so when they were trying to gain ground, they could stand in line and bump their shields uh, right up against each other side by side and create this wall that they could all hide behind, and then they could advance forward. It made like this movable wall that enabled them to gain ground while they were still being protected. Now, the shield was made out of wood and leather. So a craftsman would take multiple layers of animal hide, uh, usually about six, and, and stack them on top of each other and weave them very tightly together to create this very thick and tough covering. And then he would create a wood frame and then take the hides that he has now woven together and stretch them out over the frame and attach it. And it made this very formidable uh, protection in front of them that would stop an arrow, a pretty sharp arrow. So... Um, to prevent the shield from cracking, 
because, you know, leather back then is the same as leather today. So if you have leather furniture, you know you have to take care of it. You have to treat it. You have to rub it down with conditioner because if you don't, it dries out and it cracks, right? Well, the same thing is true for their shield. So um, if it became brittle, it would not stop the arrow from going through. It would easily pierce through it because it would crack very easily and then you know, puncture the soldier. So in order to keep it in good shape, every day it is said that the soldier would rub it down with oil in order to keep it supple and pliable, which by doing that kept it very strong. And then before battle, the soldier would soak his shield in water. He would find a lake or a stream or a river or some place that would hold the entire shield and lay it face down in the water and let it soak until it was fully immersed and had absorbed all the water that it could possibly absorb. And the reason for this is because it was a precautionary measure. Not only were arrows being fired at them, but during the first century, the enemy would dip the tip of the arrow into pitch and then set it on fire and then shoot it at them. So if your, if your shield had not been soaked in water, when that fiery arrow came, it may have stopped it from going through and piercing you, but this flaming arrow was now lodged inside your shield, and it set your shield on fire and burned it slap up. And now you are left defenseless because your shield is just ashes, right? But if it had been soaked in water, and the leather was holding water, and the wood was holding water, when that arrow came and punctured your shield, the water that was being held inside of it would now extinguish the flaming arrow. So it, there was a lot of work involved in this. It required daily maintenance, and before battle, it required soaking, which made it very heavy and cumbersome. But nonetheless, it was a requirement for successfully uh, navigating your way through a battle. So what does all this have to do with living armed and dangerous? To start, we obviously know that our shield is not made of wood and leather. Uh, but our, the material of our shield is faith, because that's what Paul says, is to take up the shield of faith. So what is faith? Let's talk about this for a few moments uh, because to me, like the word righteousness, the word faith can be this vague concept or principle uh, that we have trouble wrapping our mind around. Would anybody agree with that? That it's one of those things that we, we toss around in our Christianese and, and we don't really know what we're saying. We got an idea of it, but if somebody acts asked us to explain it, well, we probably couldn't put it into words. We probably couldn't say because we just kind of have the fringes of it. And we kind of know what some other people have said, but, you know, we're not really sure. So we're going to talk about what faith is because if we're supposed to take up the shield of faith, then I really should know what faith is. And we're going to start to define faith by saying what faith is not. Because a lot of times... We can see clearly what something is when we peel away what it's not. So the first thing that faith is not is faith is not believing really hard or wanting something really, really bad or desperately. You know, without saying it, because we never would, we never would, but if we were to try to put what we think and what we feel about faith into words, we could almost say that it's kind of magical. That it's, it's like making a wish. Like it's the Disney experience of when you wish upon a star and then you hope with super great intensity as in I'm crossing my fingers kind of hope with nervous anticipation Oh, I just hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I just, oh, yes, I'm just believing, I believe, I believe, and I believe, I believe, I believe, then it's going to come true. That's kind of what our idea of faith can be sometimes, uh, but that's not what it is. Faith is not jumping off a cliff or flying blind. We say that a lot. 
blind faith. Blind faith. And we'll kind of talk about that later, but that's not what faith is. Uh, Faith is not the denial of our circumstances. Faith is, is not pretending that negative things are not happening to you. You know, um, I was telling somebody earlier tonight that in the early 90s, I got a, if, you, if you've been in the church realm for, for any length of time, you've probably heard about the faith movement. And in the early 90s, I kind of got caught up into that. And so I believe that if my head hurt, I couldn't say that my head hurt because then that probably meant that I was going to end up with a brain tumor or something. You know, if something's negative happening to me, my car's broken down, my bank account's empty, I don't feel good, I have some kind of problem, I can't say that because then I'm not living in faith. And so even though my head feels like it is going to come off my body, it hurts so bad. If somebody said to me, how you doing? I am blessed and highly favored. As I'm gritting my teeth because I can't hardly see you because I feel like I got a knife going through my eyeball and I kind of need to vomit. But I'm good. I am so good right now. It's not even funny how good I am. And so the idea is that, you know, faith, faith denies what's going on. But that's not what faith is. Faith is not positive thinking. Now, I'm not against positive thinking. I really encourage positive thinking in that my mind is filled with truth. And I'm thinking about who God is and the truth of his word. But positive thinking is not in and of itself faith. And when ideas like this define faith for us, then faith really becomes something that's pretty scary. If, if faith is flying blind, I don't know that I want to fly. If faith is jumping off a cliff, I don't think I'm going to go hiking, you know? If faith is, is wanting something really hard, then how, how hard is hard? If faith is saying the right things, then what are the right things? And what happens if I don't do it the right way? You see, concepts like this about faith make faith seem very vague and elusive. It it makes it seem like it's unattainable. That maybe only certain people can reach that level, can have faith. It makes it seem as if we are just grasping at thin air in order to get what we are not really sure about in the first place. It makes you think you have to work at it really, really hard. And ideas like this make it seem like faith is undefinable. But none of those things that I just mentioned uh, sound anything like the biblical definition of faith. And the Bible is very plain and clear about what faith is. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is, okay, there we go. It's going to tell us. It's going to tell us. We're not going to have to guess or anything. It's going to tell us. Faith is confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us, it being faith, faith gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Now, in some translations, it says faith is the substance. So when I hear the word substance, when I hear the words confidence and assurance, those don't look very vague to me. Those don't seem like they're elusive words. Those don't seem like I'm grasping at straws. Those seem very, very firm words to me. And, and in both of the passages, our original text of Ephesians chapter 6, and then in this, this passage in Hebrews 11.1, 1, the original word for faith in both of these passages is the word pistis. That's the Greek word, pistis. And, and it means, obviously, faith, because that's how it's been translated, but it also means belief, trust, and confidence. So faith is belief, trust, and confidence. But when we're talking about biblical faith, and obviously we are because that's what we're looking at, it is the belief, the trust, and the confidence in God. 
It is belief, trust, and confidence in God. It is the strong belief that what we cannot see currently is, is greater than the reality that we do see. Not that you don't see what you see, but what you don't see is bigger than what you see. Is more real than what you see. Faith is having absolute and total confidence in something, which in this case is God, even if we cannot experience it with our senses. That we know it's a reality, even though our senses are not engaged in the process. And interestingly enough, in the same passage, Hebrews 11.1, 1, the word hope, faith is the confidence that what we hope, for will actually happen. This word hope in the Greek is the word elpizo, and it means to anticipate or to expect. In other words, hope is not what we usually refer to in our culture as we're crossing our fingers and, ooh, I just, I just hope this works out. I just hope it does. I mean, there's a possibility it might not, which is why I'm sitting on the edge of my seat with my fingers crossed, Right? That, that's not what this word means. Biblical hope is anticipation and expectation. It is the anticipation of fulfillment. Faith is the confident assurance that what we're expecting is actually going to happen. We're expecting it to happen. That's what hope means in this passage. So at the heart of faith is the belief, the trust, and the confidence in God, in his character, in his faithfulness, that who he is is what he's actually going to be. Let, let's jump down to verse 6 because this will help us. Same passage, Hebrews 11, but we're going to look at verse 6. And it's impossible to please God without faith. Okay, so we're, we're still talking about faith. And so if it's impossible to please God without faith, then the author is going to go on and tell us what that means. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. Faith starts by believing that God is real. That God is real. That he's not make-believe or a fantasy or wishful thinking or a coping mechanism or just the reason that we, the reasoning that we apply to whatever it is that we can't explain or we don't understand. That he is, he's not any of those things, but he is real. He actually does exist. Okay, let's continue. And that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So, the belief that God exists is then followed by the confident assurance that God is good and he is revealing himself to people who are looking for him. That's faith. That's what faith is. Faith is the belief that God exists. Faith is the confident expectation that who he is is what we're going to experience in every circumstance and situation. Does that make sense? Because I know that's kind of different than how we look at faith. I know what I grew up and the co what concept I had of faith when I was growing up. And this ain't it. Faith is the confident assurance that God exists and that when I'm looking for him in every circumstance and situation, I can fully expect him to be everything that he said he is and do everything that he said he would do. That's faith. That's what we find in these two verses. And when we believe, when we believe to the degree that we are confident, that we are certain that what we see, that what we don't see, is greater than what we do see. Now, y'all got to get a hold of that. That's, now, that's faith. Is that what I don't see 
is a greater reality, is more real than what I do see. Faith is the belief that God is more real than anything else in your life, that God is more real than any person in your life. Listen, I might be able to come up here to Bev and lay my hands on her and touch her, and she is tangible. She's a concrete thing. I see her, I hear her, I feel her. Faith says that even though I don't have any of those experiences with God, He's more real than Bev is. That's what faith is. I don't see him in this moment, but he's still real. He's more real than what I do see. I don't hear his voice right now, but he's more real than what I am hearing right now. I don't feel his presence right now, but, what, but he is, his presence is more real than what I am feeling right now. That's faith. It's not wishful thinking. It's not, mm, if I believe hard enough, then it'll be true. Because listen, God's real whether you believe it or not. Your belief doesn't validate his existence. Your belief doesn't bring him to a new level of anything. If you believe him, he's there. If you don't believe him, he's still there. And that's what faith is, is the understanding that no matter what is going on around me, God's more real than any of that. God's more real. Our faith is about the reality of God, and it is about his character. Because, you know, the verse in chapter 6, and the, the, the verse in chapter 11, verse 6, says that um, he rewards those who sincerely seek him. What, what, what's a reward? It's good things. Am I seeking him in this situation? Then he will meet me with good things. And that's faith, that I believe that. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I know it's going to be good. I believe that the good that he is bringing to me in this situation is more real than the negative that's happening right now. That's what faith is. It's about trusting him. Faith is about trusting in his existence and in his character. It's about his faithfulness and his goodness. It's about being so confident in those aspects that even though we don't see it with our physical eyes, we know. We know that we know that we know. I heard, I've heard older ladies say before, I know it in my knower. I know it in my knower. It is a reality. It's a reality. You see, faith should never be something that is, is mystical or confusing or elusive that we just can't seem to grasp or wrap our mind around. That, that, that's not what it's about. Because faith is what? Confident, belief, trust in God. Well, God's not vague. God's not ambiguous. God is not abstract. God is not elusive. There is no guessing about God's existence because he has proven his existence to us repeatedly. It is there for those who choose to see it. Um, God has proven his character to us over and over and over and over again in the word. There is no mystery about God's motives. Now, I'm going to be the first to say we will not ever know all there is to know about God. Even when we get to heaven and we lose this flesh covering and our minds are liberated to be everything that God created our minds to be, we will still not know all there is to know about God. We will spend the rest of eternity learning about him and never know it all. That's how huge he is. That's how vast he is. But... God certainly made it very plain and clear about a lot of things regarding himself. He's given us clear insight to his existence. He has given us clear insight to his character. He has shown us his heart. We have more than enough information to have confident trust and belief. More than enough. So, so where are we going to get it from? If that's the case, then where are we going to get it from? Let's look at Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing 
that is hearing the good news about Christ. The confident assurance that God is real and the trust that he is not hiding himself from us but is faithfully revealing himself to us that he is good, that he keeps his promises, that he does what he says he is going to do and is everything that he says that he is, even when we don't see him, even when we can't recognize him working in our circumstances, that comes from hearing the good news, hearing the gospel, hearing the word of God, hearing about Jesus. That's where faith comes from. I can't manufacture it. All I can manufacture is wishful thinking and determination with crossed fingers. That's all I'm ever going to manufacture. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. And interestingly enough, in this passage, it is actually talking about the audible experience that happens when sound travels through your ears. It's talking about actually hearing. Faith comes from sitting underneath biblical teaching, sitting underneath biblical preaching, listening to biblical testimonies, which is really important that you're here on Sunday and you're here on Wednesday, but you also are listening to the Word of God, biblical teaching throughout the week. It's very important to find someone who teaches the word of God, the straight word of God, and let it be poured into you every single day because that is where faith comes from. And it's got to be biblical. It can't just be positive information. It's got to be scriptural. It's got to be full of the word of God. So God is making himself known to us through biblical teaching. The the word of God is is the revelation of who God is. If you want to know God, here he is. This is the full revelation of who he is. From Genesis to Revelation, it is a continual unfolding of his character, of his heart, of his plan. You want to know what God's plans are? It's in the book. Do you want to know how God feels about things? It's in the book. Do you want to know what God's intentions toward you are? It's in the book. Everything you need to know about God is found right here. He is saying to us, here I am. Here I am. If you look for me, you will find me. Y'all, this is not hide and seek. Sometimes when we we hear that verse, you know, um, those who look for me will find me. Oh, well then... Where are you hiding? No, it's right here. If you look for me, you'll find me. If you open up the word of God, he is screaming to us, here I am. This is who I am. This is my heart. There's there's no evasiveness in God. He's not elusive. He's not hard to find. And, And then on top of this, he sent the living word to reveal to us his heart. Look at John one, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll jump down to 14. John 1, 1 and 2 and 14. In the beginning, the Word already existed. Okay, the Word. Who is the Word? Jesus. The Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. Verse 14 so the word became human and made his home among us. So if, if he's revealing himself to us through the word, he is revealing himself to us through the written word, but also the living word, Jesus. Go to, go to chapter 14, same book, John 14, verses 8 and 9. Philip said, and this is Philip speaking to Jesus. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Now, I can just imagine how Jesus replies here. Jesus replies, "Uh, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Jesus was the representation and the revelation of God to man. 
He was making the Father clear to us. You know, all this talk about God's hard to know, God's hard to find, you know, he's just really elusive, he's a mystery. Mm. That's not true. That's not true. He put on flesh and came and lived among us and then recorded it in here for us to read it and know it and study it. And then everything else in here outside of the Gospels just support everything that we see in the Gospels. This is the revelation of of, of God himself. And then add on top of that the Spirit of God who bears witness to the Word. Who bears witness to the Word. Go to 1 Corinthians 2, chapter uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. Now get this next sentence. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. God's not hiding himself. You can know all of God that you want to know. He goes on to say, no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit. Are you a believer? Then the spirit of God is living in you, not the world spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. God is not hiding himself. God's not making it difficult to get to know him. God's not elusive. He's not evasive. Instead, God is very plainly, demonstratively exposing himself for anybody who wants to see him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. You'll find me. He's in plain sight. He is in plain sight. And that is, is the basis of your faith. That is the foundation of your faith, the existence and the character of God. The more you know about God, the more your faith is going to grow. The more your faith grows, the larger your shield gets. You can have a shield that's barely big enough to cover your knuckles, or you can have a shield that dwarfs you. You choose. You choose how big your shield is going to be. You can customize it so that it is as large as you want it to be. Because the more you know about God, the more secure you become in his character. The more confident you become in his ability. The more secure and confident you become in his character and his ability, then the more you'll realize that you can stand in confidence And be assured of the fulfillment of the promises that he's made you. If I know he's good and I know he's able, then I know the promises he made to me are going to come to pass for me. The more you know about God, the more you understand of him and his word, then the more real he becomes to you, than the circumstances you're fighting in. And when you know that, you can hide in that. If my shield is only as big as my little knuckles right here, um, the fiery darts are going to get me. But if my shield is enormous because I have delved in and I know God and I know he's faithful, I know he's good. I know he is able and capable. Then I'm going to hide behind that when stuff starts happening because stuff's going to happen, right? We've already established that. Negative things are going to happen to you because the enemy has a plan for your life. And just because you're a believer doesn't make you exempt from that. In fact, being a believer makes you a target. You need a shield. How big do you need your shield to be? Then you need to be digging in and and understanding who God is, shoring up that foundation of faith, removing all, all semblances of doubt. 
But I can't get rid of the doubt if I don't know who he is. If I don't grow in my confidence and my assurance of who he is. And so if, if my understanding of him grows, then my shield grows. Then when the fiery darts come, those lies of the enemy, those negative situations that are ignited and on fire with panic and fear and worry and anxiety and stress and every other negative emotion that we could possibly think about, then all I have to do is hold up my shield, just stand right behind that. Because y'all, the enemy's going to say what he's going to say. He's going to scream at you all kinds of craziness. He's going to try to set your life on fire with fear and doubt and worry and anxiety. And he's going to try to make you question God's goodness and God's faithfulness and God's ability and God's reliability. He's going to try to make you question that God's with you, that he hears your prayers. But if you know that you know down in your knower... And you have the confident assurance that not only does he exist, but that he is good and I can expect goodness from him. I can hope the confident expectation of deliverance of everything that he said. I can stand behind that all day long while the devil just whizzes stuff, whizzes stuff by me. Smelling smoke, stuff's on fire everywhere. I can stand behind my shield. I can know that he's good, that he's for me, he's not against me, that he's taking care of me, that he is providing for me, that he's going to do what's best for me every single time. I can stand behind that shield. Psalm 3, 3. When I understand who God is, when I have delved into that and that has become a confident assurance, the bedrock of my life, then Psalm 3, 3 says, but you, O Lord, are a shield around me. See, the shield of faith is, is faith in God. When I'm picking it up and I'm believing that he says who he says he is, God himself becomes my shield. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. You can sing in the middle of a mess if you've got your shield of faith up. Psalm thirty-three twenty. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Proverbs 35 Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. God himself is our shield. My faith, my confidence, my trust in the expectation that he's everything that he says he's going to be. When I am in that place, he comes and covers me. Psalm 91, Bill read it Sunday, that we can hide in the shadow of his wings. How do you get in the shadow of the wings? Through faith. Believing that he's there. Believing that his wings cover me. Believing that his wings will protect me and shield me. Believing that he is my defense. Not wishful thinking. Not, mm, I hope this happens. I got to believe hard enough. Look. All I have to do is dismiss all doubt and cling to truth and faith is in place. Dismiss doubt, cling to truth. That's why your belt is so important and faith is in place. But you have to know truth, right? If I don't know the truth, then there's nothing to cling to. And then I don't have a shield. If we don't grow in our knowledge and understanding of God, then our shield is small and it's flimsy and it will not protect us from the darts that fly our way. Hosea 4.6, we'll write that down. Hosea 4.6, this is God speaking and he says, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. That means... Not that, that we don't know his name or that he's there, but we don't know him. 
we don't have an intimate knowledge of him. The devil's eaten our lunch because we're not intimate with God. And if, we don't, if we're not intimate with him, then we don't know him. And if I don't know him, then I can't trust him because I don't have any confidence in him. And if I don't have any confidence in him, I will turn to something else. I'll go find another solution. I'll conjure up a plan B. I'll have to have something that I can hang on to if I don't think I can hang on to God. You, we have to know him. And in knowing him, that means that I can trust him. And then well, no matter what's happening, no matter what he's telling me, I can go into that. I can go into the fray knowing I'm going to come out on top because I can trust him. Look, here's an example. This ties back into what I said earlier about flying blind. Because if we're flying blind, I don't really want to fly. I need to see where I'm going. And I would, I would say to Bill all the time in times past, I would say, if I will do anything he tells me. I'll go anywhere God says to go. I'll do anything he says to do. I just need a map. I just need him to come and lay the blueprints out to me and go, okay, right here, you're going to turn left. And then when you get there at the big chicken, then I'm going to send somebody to say something to you, and then you're going to do this, and then I'm going to place this in your hand, and then I want you to move south. You, th this is what I'm looking for. And Bill would just go, okay, well, then that's not faith. That's not faith. To which I would say, yeah, but I don't want to fly blind. Just lay it all out for me, and then I'll do it. But see, here was my problem. I didn't know God. So I was afraid. Well, what's he going to make me do? What's he going to require of me? If you give me the plans, then we might can negotiate about what happens when we get to the big chicken. Well, God, I'll do this, and I'll still get to where you want me to go, but... I'm going to go this way instead of that way because that way looks way more complicated to me. See, it wasn't about flying blind. It was about not knowing him. Look, here, here's an example for you. If I'm standing out in the parking lot and a guy drives up that I have never seen in my entire life and he pulls up next to me and he says, hey, get in the car. I'm not getting in the car. I don't know you. I don't know what your intentions are. I don't know where you plan to take me. I don't know what is going to happen when we get to where we're going. I don't know what's going to happen on the way to where you think we're going. And so what is my, my answer? I am running. I am running as hard and as fast as I can because I don't know you and therefore I don't trust you. Now, if someone that I'm familiar with pulls up and says, hey, Kim, get in the car. Well, where are we going? Well, just get in the car. No, where are we going? I mean, I know you and I like you, but that's kind of weird. <laughs> so you tell me what's happening here, and then I'll let you know whether or not I'm going to get in the car. But if Bill pulls up in the parking lot and he says, get in the car, I'm getting in the car. And I don't need to know anything because I know Bill. And I know his heart. And I know he loves me. And he only has good plans for me. And everything that he does will be a benefit to me. Even if it's something that is totally not exciting like going to Lowe's. Because chances are he's buying something to fix something for me. See, I, I'll just get in the car with him because I know him. I'm not flying blind. He sees. He knows. And I trust that. So that's the same thing with God. He's not asking you to step off a cliff and cross your fingers that there's a trampoline at the bottom. God's just saying, look, walk with me. Walk with me. And my response should be, I know you so 
well. I'll go anywhere with you. And I don't have to know the details because they're good. And I don't have to know the route because it's good. And you're going to benefit me and you're going to bless me. And I don't have to know how or when or anything else. I'll go with you. See, I'm not blind because I see him. I see him. And that's faith. And that's what the shield of faith is. When I engage the shield of faith, when I take it up, it's like, I don't know what's happening right now. This is chaotic. This is crazy. This isn't the plan. I don't know. I woke up in the middle of a mess. And he says, I'm covering you. And it may get scary, but I'm right here. Even if you don't feel me, even if you don't see me, even if you don't hear me, I'm right here. And I trust that. And it protects me from the lies of the enemy, and it protects me from panic and chaos, and it protects my life from going up in flames. That's what faith is. Well, we'll pray. Abba, thank you. Thank you for being so good and for revealing yourself to us. Thank you that you're not complicated to get to. Now, we don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops and ceremony, but just in Jesus, we can come right up to you. Thank you that that you're more than what our minds even know and understand. Thank you that you've given us what we need so that we can grow in confident assurance of your presence in our life despite what's going on. I thank you that you have become for us our shield, that you want to be our shield, that you want to be the one that stands between us and the fiery darts, that you are willing to take every fiery dart in order to protect us. Thank you so much for that. And I pray that you would teach us. Holy Spirit, we don't know how. We don't know how to live in faith. We don't know how to just put all of our confidence in you. Fear is a hindrance for us. Reasoning is a hindrance for us. Lies from the enemy as a hindrance for us. And I pray that you would teach us how to circumvent all of those obstacles and come to the place where we have such overwhelming confidence in you that you are a greater reality to us than anything that we see or hear or feel. And I pray for every woman here, every person that's here. I just ask you to Wrap your arms around them to hold them close, to whisper into their heart the things that they need to hear. I ask you to be their strength and their peace, to be their provider. You know what they're looking for, what they're searching for. And God, your word says that when we search for you in the middle of anything, that you will be found by us. And I pray that you would enable them to make that connection with you. Pray that you would protect them. And I pray, Father, that you would bring us back together on Sunday so that we can celebrate you and who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.